Okay, is there anybody else here today that was not here on Monday and did not get handouts? You guys missed the first lab. And this term is pretty much similar to identical to 112. Did you realize that? Okay. You're going to be too bored. <laughs> Okay, anybody else? Oh, but you got handouts from your brother. <laughs> okay. Okay, so if you go to the Canvas site, you'll notice that I have put the first lecture up so you can review that, or if you missed the lecture, you can watch that. Because the first quiz in class is going to be on Monday. And so, so it's going to be over that information from Monday and today only. However, I also have included a homework assignment. So what you're going to do for this homework assignment is you're going to go to this, um, click on this link, and then it's going to give you a link to an interview. And the interview is about seven minutes. That specifically talks about the two biologists who studies how organisms are evolving to human cities. And so what I'd like you to do is copy these questions down. You can put them into a Word document if you wanted to, um, or a text document, and then just type up the answers. But remember, the answers need to be in full sen sentences, and they need to be in your own words. So if you copy somebody's and put it in there, and word for word that will be easier to achieve. So you want to make sure that you write it out in your own words. And then there might be some additional uh, things that you need to look up on the internet. Right? So for example, what is an ecosystem engineer and what are some non-human examples of ecosystem engineers? And then there's a new term that um, has been coined by evolutionary bi biologists that is called human-induced rapid evolutionary change, or HIRA. And so they provide an example of that, but there might be um, other species that are also exhibiting that type of evolutionary change. They might do a little bit of research to find those. So are there any questions about this homework assignment? Yes. When I try to view it, it says it's still not unlocked, along with the textbook as well. Well, thank you. Jeez, how could that not be unlocked? Yeah, like the syllabus, like all this stuff still says that it's locked in the video that's uh, Okay. So see how these are all green? I forgot to do the green up at, on top. Thank you so much. There we go. So now it's all unlocked. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that for those of you who stressed out. Okay. Any other problems, questions? Anything else? Okay. Okay. So um, if you remember, we were talking about mechanisms of macroevolution. And one of those was the modification of an already existing structure. So from lab, what would be an example of that mechanism as observed in those Caribbean anoles? Modification of an already existing structure. Their tails or their legs, right? So in some cases, when they were on the twigs, their legs became shorter. And so what they've discovered recently is, is that there are genetically uh, master control genes. And these master control genes control how things develop. So they turn on and turn off other genes that will control the rate of development and perhaps the lengthening of the arms. So from the video, what was the major isolating mechanism, the reproductive isolating mechanism between the adults? What kept them from having sex? The differences over the Denlock or Dulock. 
things called actually do lot. So remember they have the do lot and the, the difference in the color. And so that could be due to differences in the concentration of melanin or the types of melanin. Some melanin is brown, some melanin is more red, and that's the difference between like brown haired individuals and red haired individuals and humans, but also the, the um, size and the shape of the uh, do lot and the um, and the color of it. Okay. So that would be an isolating mechanism that keeps those species apart. So that was one example. What was the other example of a mechanism that we talked about on Monday? Give me your notes. Do we have their notes in front of them? Nobody has their notes. Nobody wants to. Four lines of birthdays? Huh? Is it four lines of birthdays? No. That's actually an example, but that's not a mechanism. So the four arms of vertebrates is actually, when we looked at that, that would be a modification of an already existing structure. So um, we have the same set of bones, but during embryonic development, they grow at different rates. And so they end up being different sizes. So it was this example. So this is an example of an adult amphibian that, um, is has all the juvenile characteristics. So remember the second mechanism is retention of juvenile characteristics, right? So we can actually retain some characteristics that we have early on during embryonic development. And in this case, it was the nukes um, retaining the gills and the tail of the tadpole and that they are adults. And we'll look at other examples of this when we talk about vertebrates. Okay, so the third mechanism of macroevolution is demonstrated by this. And this is what is referred to as the acquisition of foreign traits. Oops, so this would be actually number three. Sorry, this is number three. So this is the third mechanism. So this is not in your textbook, but there are many examples of this in the human, or not the human, in the animal diversity. So I'm going to give you examples of this repeatedly. But these are examples of gel jellyfish that are stingless. So most jellyfish have stinging cells. And they use those stinging cells in order to capture prey. So most jellyfish are carnivorous. They swim through the environment and they capture their prey and then they bring it into their mouth to feed. And some of those stings can actually sting us, right? So if you have these big jellyfish that are feeding upon um, fish, their stings are able to penetrate the scales of the fish. So they're able to penetrate our skin as well. And so it can be really painful, kind of like a um, maybe it's a sting of a wasp, but you generally get many of them along the length of your arm if you happen to touch them. So these stingless jellyfish are very popular. They're actually found in an inland marine lake in Indonesia, in um, a region called Palau. And um, you can sign up and get on a year, multi-year waiting list in order to visit this lake and swim with the jellyfish. But they're stingless because they don't capture um, their food, but rather they rely upon symbiotic algae. So this symbiotic algae are acquired, right? So acquisition, so the symbiotic algae um, make the jellyfish capable of photosynthes photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is not normally seen in animals. And so this is just an example of how an animal has acquired the ability to become photosynthetic. And so photosynthesis is a foreign trait that can be acquired by some animals. And we'll talk about how important this is in the case of coral, which are also related to the jellyfish. 
So three mechanisms, modification of already existing structures, retention of juvenile traits, and acquisition of foreign traits. Those would be the three mechanisms that we need to know. Okay, so those are mechanisms, but we also need to kind of figure out how we are going to determine relationships between major groups of organisms. So when you are in lab and you are trying to determine the uh, cladogram based upon the hemidacules, which are those imaginary organisms, what did you use as your basis for determining their relationship? Did you look at their fossils? No, what did you do? What did you look at? Their structure, okay? So we can first, one example of this is structural similarities. Right? So this is the way that biologists worked in the past is, is that they assumed that organisms that look closely, that look similar are closely related, right? So the assumption here, oops, uh, assumption, So they're more closely related. Okay, so did this work for the Anolis lizards? Were all the twig from each island, were they all more closely related evolutionarily? Were the tree Anolis all more closely related evolutionarily or was it actually where they were located in the environment that determined their evolutionary relationship? where they were located, right? So the second way that we can determine evolutionary history is looking at biogeography. So this is where organisms are located in the environment. So just like with structural similarities, if they are located on the same island, then they're more closely related than species that are located on a different island. And that could be true, and it is true for the Anolis lizards, but it might not be true for other species. Okay, so that's just one line of evidence, one piece of evidence that we can use to determine evolutionary relationships. Okay, So the third one, could be fossil, the fossil record. Oops. Okay. So can we find what are referred to as transitional species? So these would be species that appear to be um, similar to modern day, but they're a little bit different and they might be similar to like two different groups of modern day species. So a good example of this would be um, the elephants. So there's actually two groups of elephant, elephants, two different species. There's the Asian elephant, and then there's the African elephant. Now, if we look at their relatedness to all of the other mammals, what mammal are they more closely related to that, that is still alive today? Does anybody know? So what do they have down in Florida, swimming around in the Everglades and those canals? Not alligators, it's a mammal. Manatees, okay. okay. 
And then I'm going to give you a really weird one, the rock hyrax. Okay. So in the fossil record, we can find connections between these three very different groups of organisms. So one of the characteristics is that they have toe pads. And so it's really weird. I should have a picture of this. If you look at the um, picture of the elephant skeleton, even though they have these huge feet and it looks like they're standing like we do on the soles of their feet, they're actually up on their toes, right? So the, the foot of the, of the elephant, so it's kind of like an ungulate. It's up on its toes like a horse or a deer. And those um, toe pads can be found in the manatees, and then they can also be found in the rock hyrax. So let's just look at an evolutionary tree. This is not in your textbook. Okay. So um, wherever the line stops, so this is in time. So if the line stops, then these have gone extinct and they have not survived to modern day. Okay. So we have, um, actually there's three. There's three different species. So there's two African and one Asian. So there's three species of elephants today. The mammoth obviously was around. We have skeletons of them. Um, I just went to uh, the La Brea Tar Pits and they have tons of mammoth skeletons. They're really cool in LA. And then you can see that there are some examples of elephants that look very strange, have like an uh, extended lower jaw. Those were called the shovelers. And then that one that has the tusks that come this way. But if you look back in the fossil record, you can see that the elephants actually evolved from smaller um, extinct um, organisms that were just starting to develop the trunk-like structure. So when you look at the embryo of an elephant, it first starts out having an upper lip and a nose like we do. And then the upper lip and the nose fuse and then that elongates during development to form the trunk. So you can imagine if our upper lip and our nose fuse, what that would be like. And then you can see that the manatee <coughs> is related to it. It actually has on its uh, flippers, it's an aquatic organism, but it has toe pads. And then we have the rock hyraxes. So the rock hyraxes are actually from Africa. And they are very interesting because in uh, native cultures in Africa, they were actually um, said to be a relative of the elephant. So the native cultures recognized that the hyraxes were related. So if you look at the manatees, you have those toe pads, right? Toe pads, very similar to what we see on the elephants. And then we have these toe pads on the hy rock hyraxes. And interestingly, the rock hyraxes also have little tusks that are similar to the tusks that we see in the elephant. So we um, obviously have, uh, the scientists have looked at DNA evidence, and so the molecular evidence also supports that these organisms are related evolutionarily. So that would be another example of a line of evidence. So let's go back to that. Okay, so four would be molecular data. Okay, so this assumes that the more similar the DNA sequence, and they look at not just one sequence, but many sequences, the more closely related. So you did that with your Kaminaculis. I gave you some molecular information and it, de it deviated from what you had created simply looking at structural. <laughs> so one thing that we have to pay attention to when we're determining evolutionary relationships is this idea of convergent evolution. So we're gonna talk about convergent evolution. So this is not a mechanism, uh, really a macro evolution, but rather it is kind of a, a something, it's an example of evolution. Okay. 
So this is where two groups of uh, organisms evolve similar traits. And I'll put independently. So the reason they look alike is not due to the fact that their ancestor had those traits, but rather they evolve similar traits because they are found in similar environments. Okay, so this is due to the evolution in similar, oops, similar. Niches. And that interview is with, uh, I think it must be European. The Europeans say niche. So they say it differently than we say it in America. So we call them a niche. They say a niche. Okay? So that's the environment. That's everything in the environment. right? And so we have an example of a sugar glider in Australia and a flying squirrel in North America. So we actually have flying squirrels in North America. And I only know this because, unfortunately, I had a cat when I lived up river who would occasionally bring in, he only brought in two, but he brought in two flying squirrels. And um, the flying squirrels actually live up in the pine trees, and they come down to eat bacon, and then they go back up into the pine trees. And then they use this flap of skin between their forearm and their hind leg to soar, they glide from one treetop to the other. So it's very unlikely that they come down very often. But then they just pop. And then the sugar glider is actually a marsupial. This is actually a placental. They are far apart biogeographically, but they look very similar to one another. They also are very different developmentally, being a marsupial, where they have, where they start out as really tiny, underdeveloped um, embryos that attach to their mother's nipples, versus the placental mammals. Okay. So these two would be examples of convergent evolution. The anolis lizards, the tree uh, lizards on one, the tree anoles on one island, and the tree anoles on another also were examples of convergence evolution because they evolved those traits independently of one another. So this is different than what we call divergent evolution. <coughs> okay, so this is where one group gives rise to many groups. And my favorite example of divergent evolution occurred when the dinosaurs went extinct. Because before that time, when we look in the fossil record with the dinosaurs, we have mammals, but they were like small rodent-like creatures. And then as soon as those dinosaurs went extinct, there happened to be an opening up and the, the planet stabilized. There happened to be a lot of niches opened up. And then we see this um, massive evolution of mam mammals to fill the niches that were left behind by the dinosaurs. So we have the ancestral mammal. Right? This gave rise to many different groups in the evolutionary tree, right? Including mammals that returned to the water. So the ancestral mammal was terrestrial, but when we look at the aquatic mammals like the whale, right? It has evolved the aquatic characteristics, but it's still warm-blooded. It still produces milk. It still nurses its offspring. And it still breathes air rather than having gills. So that's an example of divergent evolution. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about constructing cladograms and remember that cladograms are just evolutionary histories. 
It's just one way to draw them. And they can be drawn facing up, um, or they can be drawn to the side, like I showed you with the elephants. So the elephants and the manatees and the rock hyraxes and all those weird um, creatures that have gone extinct, that would be an example of a cladogram. So in the cladogram, we have a branch that can give rise to other branches. And I'm just going to draw a very simple example of a cladogram like this. So we can put on this cladogram organisms. And so let's put um, a barnacle up here. And I'll show you a picture of a barnacle in a second if you don't know what they are. And this would be an example of a shrimp. And this would be an example of a clam. So we can talk about ancestral characteristics that occur way back here. So this would be, I'm gonna just put, a, put an arrow to it. That is an ancestral characteristic. So if I put a characteristic back on this part of the cladogram, that means that all the other organisms that we see have that ancestral characteristic. So can anybody give me an example of what might be something that all of these have? So the example maybe of what do all animals have? Well, we're gonna talk about one example. And so I'll just introduce it here. And this is called symmetry. And so it'd be like bilateral symmetry. So all of these organisms, you can cut them in one plane and have two identical halves. I am bilaterally symmetric right down the middle. And all, most animals have bilateral symmetry. Clam is obvious because even its shell can be pulled apart, two pieces that are identical. Okay. So then when we look up here, right? These are actually derived traits. So they are not ancestral, but they arose in this group or the ancestor to this group. So it's said to be a derived trait. Okay, so it's more recent in the evolutionary history of animals. And so this would be jointed appendages. So in the shrimp, if you can visualize shrimp, you know, they have all these appendages that shovel or move food towards their mouth, right? They have the antennae, which is in jointed, right? They even have eyes on stalks that move, they're jointed, right? And so those would be a jointed appendages. The clam has a shell. But so does the barnacle. So I would have to put shell up here too. So what this means is, is that the shell arose twice independently because the ancestor did not have it. So we are going to learn the different major groups of animals. And so if you can visualize them placed in a cladogram, it's going to be a lot easier to remember how they are related and what their characters are, because this gives us a lot of information okay, about their relationships and their characteristics. Okay. So let's look at the barnacle. So you can go to the Oregon coast and find barnacles. Right? I think this is called a gooseneck barnacle right here. And they're closed up when they're out of water, but when they are in water, they open up. And they have these jointed appendages that come out and they go like this. But if I was just looking at this, I might think that it is closely related to the clam because it has a shell. Right? This would be an example of convergent evolution. Right? The clam and the barnacle look alike because they have, both have a shell, but they um, are more 
distantly related than you would think. Okay. So then comparing the barnacle to say, for example, I think this is a mussel, okay, and then the shrimp. So that barnacle is actually more closely related to the shrimp than it is to the mussel or to the clam. Okay, so that's how you uh, create and read cladograms. Okay. So taxonomy. So taxonomy predates um, Darwin's theory about uh, natural selection and the origin of, sp of species. So in general, it doesn't take into consideration evolutionary history. Okay, so does not generally take into, and this is kind of a wordy way to say it, sorry, consideration uh, into, sorry, it doesn't take evolutionary history. Here we go, <laughs> evolutionary history. So it was developed in the 1700s. And Darwin didn't come around until 1850s to describe um, the changes in species. So it is simply placing uh, organisms into groups in order to better study them, right? And so we looked at the hierarchy. So what was the first most inclusive uh, taxonomic hierarchy? Do you remember? Okay, so we have, oops, sorry, kingdom. So all the organisms that we're gonna study um, this quarter are in the kingdom Animalia, okay? And then we have, what's next? Phylum. So for example, we're in the phylum Chordata. What's next? Class. Order. Family. Genus and species. Okay, so you need to be able to use the taxonomic hierarchy, and generally, you need to know the order in which things appear. So, for example, if I say something is in the same order, so let's say um, we have um, a dragonfly and a butterfly are in the same. A dragonfly and a damselfly are in the same order. If they're in the same order, then therefore they're in the same class, they're in the same phylum, and they're in the same kingdom. If they're in the same genus, they would have to be in the same family. Okay? So this becomes most inclusive to least inclusive. And we talked about in lecture how you would designate the name, the species name, by using the genus and the species. Okay. So in your book, there is a diagram that shows, or an image that shows this classification scheme. So we have do dogs, and one of the really interesting things is, is that their canis lupus, that is the same um, species as a wolf. So wolves and dogs are actually the same species, but what is that familiar? What is that called? Does anybody know? Maybe it's domesticated, but what is it? Is it's not a species name, it's a subspecies. Okay. So dogs and wolves are a different subspecies, and so that's why they put the dog up there. But notice that the same species, penis, is the genus name, and lupus is the species name. Notice how the genus name is capitalized and lupus is lowercase. Okay. And then um, as you go down, they actually drew, drew it from least inclusive to most inclusive, so opposite of what I put. But you'll notice that all the canids, canids include foxes, for example. Order carnivora, that would include the cats. Okay. Class mammalia, that would actually include us. 
Chordata, Animalia, and you don't need to know the domain here. But you should, um, uh, starting with the kingdom, know the order in which these occur. Okay. Are there any questions about that idea? Okay. Okay, so today we are going to start talking about animals. And we're going to start talking about the different um, animals that occur in different phyla. So phylum is singular, what phyla would be the plural uh, root of that word. And so I already mentioned one of these characteristics, but if we look at animals, they are all multicellular. We are, we are thought to have evolved from a unicellular ancestor, but multicellularity is an ancestral trait. All animals have it, as do all plants and all fungi. We also um, have symmetry. Actually, the lack of asymmetry or a lack of symmetry is called asymmetry. So this would be no symmetry. And there's one group of organisms that have this. Some organisms have radial symmetry. And most animals have bilateral symmetry. So um, some people get this confused. Uh, bilateral symmetry, even earthworms, you can cut them down the middle, even though they're round, right, essentially. You can cut them down the middle, and you'll have two identical halves, the way that they're internally and externally divided. So radial symmetry is seen only within organisms like the jellyfish and sea stars and sea urchins, and the, those are called the echinoderms. So this is the idea that you can cut the organism in many planes to get two identical halves. So in your book, they have some images of symmetry. So this would actually be a sea anemone, which is a relative of um, the jellyfish and also a relative of um, coral. This would be an organism that has bilateral symmetry. Now, one of the things that goes along with bilateral symmetry is what is referred to as cephalization. So that root word, cephali, means head. And so this means that they have a head end. So they have an aggregation of nerve cells at one end, and it's called the anterior end. So you notice that you don't have any anterior or front head or tail end in an organism that has radial symmetry. So when you look at a jellyfish, it moves through its environment in all directions. It doesn't have a head, so it's not moving through its environment in one direction. But as soon as we get bilateral symmetry, we see that there is a head end and a tail end. And you want most of the nervous tissue to be um, entering the new environment first. We're kind of weird because we're standing upright. Um, but if we were on all, all fours, we would have a head end, right? So it's kind of kind of weird because our head and our tail are all in alignment. We kind of walk through our environment first, whole body. But most animals have a distinct head end. And so this is um, related to the evolution of bilateral symmetry. So I'll just put related to bilateral symmetry. You want to be able to detect your um, environment as soon as you enter it. So imagine if that goat had its brain in its middle of its body, right? That would probably not be the best place for your brain. Okay, you'll notice that near the brain, we have a lot of sensory structures too, right? So we're sensing the environment as we enter it.
So we're going to talk about animal anatomy and physiology later. But when we look at animals, we can talk about the development of what we call tissues. And tissues are groups of cells that have a common structure and function. So embryonically, we start out with having layers of tissue. So we can talk about the embryonic tissues. So we all start out as a single cell, and this cell divides until it becomes multicellular embryo. And then all of a sudden, the cells start to line up together, and they form tissues. And so our embryonic tissues are the outer tissue, which is called the ectoderm. So ecto means outside, derm means in this case layer. We also have the mesoderm and we have the endoderm. So when we're embryos, we get, we're, we're three layers of tissue and then those tissues specialize. So these are unspecialized. But if we look at where the specialized tissues are, so we'll put specialized right here. The ectoderm makes up our skin, which is kind of obvious, but also in us, it makes up our nervous system. So our brain and spinal cord is derived from ectoderm. The middle layer in our embryo is actually like muscles and bones. Okay, so our bones are derived from that middle layer. And the endoderm is the lining of organs, like the lining of our gut. So if animals have all three of these tissue layers as embryos, they are said to be triploblastic. That means they have, have all three tissue layers. We are triploblastic, but not all animals are, and I'll give you an example of that when we get there. So this is an example of a tri triploblastic. So the ectoderm, they always show the ectoderm in blue. The mesoderm is in red. And then the endoderm, they generally in most textbooks show it as yellow, but here they're showing it as green. So those are the two tissue layers. So I guess I'll introduce diploblastic. So diploblastic here, you can write this under your triploblastic. Just think di means two. And so which, which layer is missing? Mesoderm, right? So they have only the ectoderm and the endoderm. So the mesoderm is missing. We also see in animals the evolution of what is called a coelom. And so that's a soft C, not, some people want to say colum, but it's actually coelom. And if you say colum, you sort of start to think of it as being the colon, which is the digestive tract. So the coelom is a body cavity lined with mesoderm. It is not to be confused with the digestive tract. So if you opened up my gut, you would see that there is a hollow space where my stomach sits, my intestines sit, there's a space, right? That is my coelom. And it is actually filled with salomic fluid. So it's a body, that's a fluid-filled body cavity. And um, it kind of allows my organs to move a little bit, but they are also connected by um, 
uh, tissue called mesenteries, everything kind of held in place in my body cavity. So we can say that some organisms are eucelimate. So U is different from A as a root. U means good. And so this means that we have a good coelom that is lined with mesoderm. So we are eucelimates. We also have acelimates. This is no coelom. These organisms are solid tissue. So if you imagine like my organs, instead of being sitting in this space, imagine them just in tissue. So imagine if I was just completely solid all the way through. That's what an AC limit is. <coughs> and then we have um, a pseudo, which means what? False. So this is a pseudo C limate. So this is a false coelom, and this is kind of an intermediate, it's kind of a transition between being an a coelomate and a u coelomate, and this is where the body cavity is incompletely lined with mesoderm. So the um, mesoderm here is in red. So notice that this one does not have any body cavity here, like, but it has a space. That's not the body cavity. That is your digestive tract, right? So flatworms have, uh, like planaria, which we'll look at in lab, have just an opening, right? But they're solid tissue. This is like a round worm. Um, actually, this one's like a round worm. Here you have the body cavity is partially lined with mesoderm, but not completely lined with mesoderm. This would be us. And so these little connections between the wall of the coelom and the digestive tract are important because they hold things in place. And so we're going to do a dissection of a rat in lab in a couple weeks. And when you pull all the organs out, you'll notice that you kind of have to cut the mesenterm. You actually have to cut this meso mesoderm to get the organs to come out because they are kind of held in place in that body cavity. This is also where blood vessels, you know, if you think about blood vessels, they actually have to get to the organs, organs that are in that cavity and they travel via the mesentery to get to the organs. So even earthworms are examples of um, eucelimates, good coelomates. Okay, so we are going to start today talking about the different phyla. And so we are going to start with the phylum porifera. So yes, sponges are animals. They are in the kingdom Animalia. So these are what we call the sponges. The sponges are deceptive in their appearance because they do have an opening at the top, but that is not their mouth nor their anus. They do not have a digestive tract. And so when we look at the sponges, they actually have no tissues. Because they have no tissues, that means they have no organs, because you remember our biological hierarchy. Right? They are composed of cells, so they are multicellular, and they have specialized cells for doing different functions that individual organs would do in our bodies, which I'll talk about that in a second. And they are filter feeders. So they do not move, they, so they're said to be sessile. So sessile means non-moving. So that's the opposite of being mobile. 
So the way that the sponges work is, is that water actually comes in through openings in their body that would be like on the sides of the sponge all over. These are called pores. And then water leaves via the um, opening at the top. So in your book, there's a diagram that shows this movement of water. So water comes in through these holes, right, all over the outside of the organism, and then it comes up and out through the top. So lining the inside of the sponge right here, they show them in red, are what are called coanocytes. So anytime you see C-Y-T-E-S, that means cell. These have another name, they're called collar cells. And they look something like this. They have this flagellum, which creates the current. And then they have like a net-like collar. So this would be like my oanocyte. This is the nucleus of the individual cell. This is like very flagell, very much like a flagell on a sperm. And then this is just like a net. And so what happens is, is that leaves mine the inside and the flagella whip around and it creates a current of water that moves food, <coughs> nutrients into the sponge. And as the water travels through this collar, which is like a net, food gets caught. And then it takes, gets taken up by the individual cell. So they don't have any digestion taking place in the space. They have only digestion taking place in the inside of the cell. So this is, they capture food, these coanocytes do. And they have intracellular digestion. So I'll put only. We have some intracellular digestion occurring in our body, but we also have the stomach and the intestines where we have extracellular digestion. So because they have no organs, they also don't have any systems, so they have to pass their food to another type of cell, which is called an amoebocyte. So that's my amoebocyte. And it just travels throughout the sponge, delivering nutrients to the rest of the cells as it is needed. So the cells that make up the rest of the body. So when you go to the store and you buy a Rupa sponge, like the sponge that you use in your bath, that is actually a plant. So that's not a real true sponge. But if you go to the art supply store, they, you see these really weird looking, looking sponges. Those generally are true sponges. And they're a lot more expensive than the bath sponges. And they're not nearly as abrasive as the Lupa sponge. Right? So those bath sponges, that's what's left over after the sponge dies. So sponges are actually able to reproduce sexually. So they produce sperm that go out into the water and the sperm can be caught by another sponge using the coanocyte. And then the amoebocyte delivers the sperm to the egg. And then the embryonic um, uh, sponge is then leaves the parent and goes out into the ocean and swims around until it drops down, becomes sessile, and becomes another individual. So they do reproduce sexually. Now, looking at this organism as it's drawn here, you would think that it does have symmetry, but it doesn't. So we would say that it has asymmetry. Oops, not asymmetry. So they are not symmetric. Okay, so let's look at a sponge, okay? So sponges can actually get huge, and um, they obviously can be marine, but they are also some examples of freshwater sponges. But if you look at this, you th would think that this is actually just a big chunk of nutrients 
if you look at it from a perspective of the ecosystem. So how do you think sponges are preventing um, being eaten by other organisms? What might you hypothesize about that, just looking at that organism? What was that? An outer coating. Maybe an outer coating, which would make it hard for an organism just to come and bite off a chunk of it. What do plants, how do plants prevent being eaten a lot? Yeah, so chemicals, right? And so um, they probably have a lot of chemical protection. Right? So that actually makes them possibly very useful to us medicinally, right? Because if you have chemicals that prevent organisms from feeding upon you, those chemicals usually interact with you and are very active biological molecules. So if you think about nicotine, nicotine is actually a chemical that's produced by the tobacco plant, and it is an insecticide. The tobacco plant uses nicotine because insects that eat tobacco and get nicotine do not like the way it makes them feel, right? So it makes up their heart, you know, it's, a, it's excitable, right? It makes your heart beat faster. And so uh, nicotine is an example um, that we actually use um, uh, as a drug because some people like the way that nicotine makes them feel and you can become addicted to it. But the chemical protection is just a, kind of an example of how this resource might be useful for, to us because they might be important pharmaceutically. So we'll put important pharmaceuticals. So medicines, medicinally. So it might be important to, especially with some of the decline of the um, marine ecosystems, to go out and make sure that we have samples of all the different species of sponges and look at the types of chemicals that they produce. Okay. Next phylum. So this is another word that's kind of hard to pronounce. It's a silent C, so it's nidaria. Nidaria, like no, we don't actually pronounce this the C. And these organisms have stinging cells. So the stinging cells are called nidocytes. And so these, all of these are organisms are carnivorous. So they go out and they feed upon other, um, generally other animals. I guess that carnivorous, that's the definition this time. Okay. So if we look at the structure of the nidocyte, the nidocyte is a cell that has on it a little trigger. And then it has this barb that shoots out like this. And this little filament is filled with chemicals. And this filament is called the nematocyst. And that nematocyst has in it generally chemicals that cause paralysis. So it's poison, they cause paralysis. So this is the sting of a jellyfish, the sting of a Portuguese man of war. We generally do not feel the sting of a sea anemone. So if you've ever been to the Oregon coast and you get to touch, you know, you have the tide pool and you get to touch them, and you're touching the sea anemones and you touch their tentacles, right? They feel sticky when you touch them. And the reason why they feel sticky is, is that you're actually activating those nematocysts but those nematocysts are not able to penetrate your skin, and so therefore you're not getting a sting from them. So these organisms have only two tissue layers. 
So they are diploblastic. Their middle layer is actually called mesoglia. So they don't have mesoderm, but mesoglia. This is not composed of cells, but it is the jelly, right, in the jellyfish. These organisms are also radially symmetric. So therefore, they do not have cephalization. So they have no brain, no cephalization. So they simply have a nerve net that extends throughout their body. They can exist in two forms. So they typically have two different types of body forms. So, for example, you could have the polyp form. So a good example of this is the sea anemone. Right? So the polyp form is sessile, meaning that it generally adheres to a substrate, and then the tentacles face upward like this. The um, medusa, on the other hand, has its tentacles facing downward. And so um, they, um, the medusa tend to be mobile. So the medusa would be like the jellyfish. And they are mobile. The other thing that you'll notice about them is, is that they have a digestive tract. So they have an opening, unlike the, um, uh, the uh, sponges, where they can take in food and they can digest it in here. So they can break it down to smaller pieces. This means that they can feed upon much larger stuff. Right? They have extracellular digestion in their digestive tract. So we'll say that they have a gastrovascular cavity where digestion occurs. Looking at these diagrams, how many openings in this gastrovascular cavity do you observe? One, right? So they have only one opening which get means that this digestive tract has an opening that has to serve as both the mouth and the anus. And so it's said to be an incomplete digestive tract. Okay. So we're going to watch a little video um, that looks at uh, the function of swimming in uh, jellyfish. So jellyfish are mobile, and obviously it takes them a lot of bit, of, a great bit of energy to move. And so the question is, why do they swim? That's the question. Movement is so much a part of our lives, it's like breathing. We don't even think about it. One of the defining characters, or what we usually think of a trait of animals, and sets them aside from example, plants, <coughs> is the ability to move. In 1990, Jack Costello began to investigate the mystery of how jellyfish move and feed.
When it's cold in Rhode Island, Costello leads a group of students back to where he conducted his breakthrough research. In search of new insights, Costello used an underwater video camera. By capturing hour upon hour of jellyfish movement on videotape, he can meticulously examine how and why they swim the way they do. One focus of his research was a group called Moon Jellies. He is fascinated by the way they move. His hours of videotape reveal that jellyfish swim constantly, but for all their movement, they don't seem to be getting anywhere. They do spend all their time swimming, and they really don't make much forward progress. So really, that leaves us asking, why would they spend their time swimming? What equally confounded Costello was that jellyfish are not designed for easy movement through the water. In fact, their body plan seems shaped to slow them down. That round disc-like shape is probably one of the least effective shapes for forward progress that we can imagine. Now there is ambient flow, so it is coming in, the animal's moving with the current. But a flattened shape moving through the water presents the most resistance in what we call drag of any form that you can imagine. To get a clearer view of jellyfish in motion, Costello established a simple experiment. Was there some hidden purpose in the jellyfish design? Perched above the rugged Big Sur coastline in Northern California, a laboratory has been established to explore and document animal behavior. Ideally, this is a little tough, isn't it? With a crew of filmmakers, Costello demonstrates his experiment. Their subject, a jellyfish the size of a water drop. What we wanted to do was look at the action of swimming and look at how it did interact with the fluid around it. Excellent, excellent. Do I have particles? Yeah. So Costello adds tiny particles to the tank enabling him to see how the water flows around the jellyfish. Now, as the jellyfish swims, it creates a visible current. Suddenly, the animal's secret is revealed. Okay. Ah, perfect. See where they flew in? Yeah. What we found through looking at it is that this very high drag body form is very good at creating vortices and flow around the bell margin so that the flow goes right through those tentacles and enables the jellyfish to capture its prey. You see, it's swimming along here, and actually it's the swimming motion and the flow created by swimming that's bringing all the prey into the capture surfaces, so that really the body that we think of as bad or ineffective for forward motion is very effective for creating the flow which enables that animal to feed. In later work, Costello revealed that each jellyfish shape creates its own distinct current allowing it to capture different prey. It's incredibly simple, but very effective system. It becomes a little more sinister when you realize that it's the mechanism for these animals to swim through the water, essentially kill all their prey.
Okay. So one last thing I want to talk about is the Portuguese man of war, because it is actually not a jellyfish. So if we look at these examples, so here's some examples of cnidarians. We talked about the sea anemone. We're going to talk about the coral next week. But this is actually the Portuguese man of war right here. And so one of the interesting things about the Portuguese man of war is that it has a float. And this float is like a sail. And so the air that comes along the surface of the ocean actually allows the um, Portuguese man of war to move. But the Portuguese man of war is not a Medusa, but rather it is a colony of specialized polyps. So I'll write that down. It looks like a jellyfish, but it is not. And these polyps are all interconnected, so they all get food, but only some of the polyps serve as feeding polyps. And so some of the Portuguese men of war have some of the most uh, uh, lethal right, um, toxins. And again, these might be really important pharmaceutically, because when we look at the toxins that are produced by these chemicals or these organisms, they are very chemically sophisticated, right? lots of chemicals in them that we might not even understand how those chemicals um, work or why they are there. So a colony of polyps attached to a float. Are there any questions? Okay, so remember that you have a uh, in-class quiz on Monday. We'll do that at the very beginning of class, and it should only take about 15 minutes. And then you might want to take a look at your homework, which is actually not due till next Wednesday, so you have a week to, to complete that homework.